You are watching DHTV from California State University to Mingus Hills. Uh, I am Bill Allen. I have the privilege of serving uh, as the CEO of the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, and on behalf of all of our staff uh, and members and board of directors, it's my pleasure to welcome you once again to our Future Forum series. And uh, we're delighted you're all, all here with us this morning for this important conversation. Uh, as many of you know who have attended prior ones, but for those of you who don't, this Future Forum series was really created to take a deep dive into the burgeoning industry sectors uh, that really drive this regional economy. Sectors like virtual medicine, cybersecurity, digital entertainment, and artificial intelligence. Fast growing emerging technologies and sectors and industries in our region that we all need to better understand in the future. Uh, as these technological innovations uh, take our economy in new directions, it's important that we recognize this region is already and will increasingly play a role as an incubator uh, for these new technologies and new business opportunities that were barely a dream in the mind of entrepreneurs just in recent years. Each of our LADC Future Forums is your opportunity to learn about the emerging trends in these key industry sectors, to learn about the changing workforce demands that will develop with these transformations, and most importantly, new opportunities for you and your enterprises that will emerge along the way. We hope you'll join our online conversation at using the hashtag LAEDC Future Forum and any other handles you see on the screen this morning. Uh, you may have noticed we didn't print program books for this event. That's because we're trying to uh, do our part in preserving our environment. But we did provide um, a digital program with our speaker lineup and full biographies of our speakers. And if you type this URL you see on the screen, uh, it's also printed in the back of your name badge, or you can access it from the confirmation email that you received from us. Uh, you can access the digital uh, program guide to this morning's future forum. The LADC's purpose really is to collectively advance opportunity and prosperity for all of the residents of the Los Angeles County region. We were founded by the county in 1981 to reside in the private sector and to engage the private sector. We were founded as a private nonprofit public benefit organization that the county recognized could engage education partners, private sector partners, other local government partners uh, in a collective effort to grow our regional economy and create more broadly shared prosperity for the residents of our region. To that end, we research the industries that provide well-paying jobs to the residents of LA County, and then we develop and implement strategies to help grow those industries uh, and to help grow jobs in those industries, while also helping our educational partners develop the curriculum uh, that can better respond to the changing workforce requirements uh, in these key industries. And one of these key industries is fintech. Global investment in fintech ventures uh, reached $25 billion in 2016, clearly signifying that the digital revolution has taken root across the financial services sector. Nearly every part of the financial services sector has been disrupted by technology. This morning, you'll hear from innovative companies that are shaping the future of fintech. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about blockchain's ever-expanding role how to best prepare tomorrow's workforce to address the needs of this rapidly evolving and growing industry. We appreciate all of you being here with us, uh, and we hope that you will join us for more of these future forums in the months to come. These forums are made possible by our partner since the inception of this series, uh, California State University Dominguez Hills. Uh, we really appreciate their foresight as an institution in bringing these forums to the public, serving as the Future Forum Series sponsor now for the third year in a row. I want to thank new President Parham for uh, his commitment to continuing this effort and for the great work his team does in partnering with us to produce these events for you. And I'll ask him to come up in a few minutes to make some formal welcome remarks. I also want to thank and acknowledge Susan Stone and Mike Quindazzi from PricewaterhouseCoopers for their commitment to helping us envision the future of these important industries. They provide the series with unparalleled expertise from their extraordinary team, and we're very grateful for their help in making these forums possible. Uh, but I did want to invite Thomas Parham, who's the new president of Cal State Dominguez Hills, to say a few words. And first, let me just say 
uh, how proud we are to have Cal State University Dominguez Hills here in Los Angeles County. This is an extraordinary institution. It's a diverse and welcoming community of learners and educators collaborating each and every day to change lives and communities for the better, and they do that. With strong academic programs, dedicated faculty mentors, supportive staff, and many campus amenities, CSU Dominguez Hills is committed to connecting students to a high quality and truly transformative education while providing our communities with a vital resource for talent, knowledge, skills, and leadership needed to thrive today and tomorrow. And as I mentioned, they have a new president. We've had a long time partnership with Dr. Parham's predecessor, Dr. Willie Hagan. Uh, and Dr. Hagan was very excited to announce that Dr. Parham would be taking over the leadership of this institution. He was just appointed in June as the 11th president of Cal State University Dominguez Hills, previously serving as vice chancellor of student affairs and an adjunct faculty member at the University of California, Irvine, where he had been since 1985. And prior to his role as vice chancellor there at UCI, he had served the institution as assistant vice chancellor for counseling and health services, counseling center director, director of the career and life planning center as well. And these are all important because we're working together closely with CSU Dominguez Hills and their sister CSUs across this county on the talent development pipeline for the region's residents and for the region's industries. He also held an appointment on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in Philadelphia. He's a nationally known psychologist, author of six books, more than 45 journal articles and book chapters. And most importantly to us, he's known as a fierce advocate for students with an unwavering commitment to student achievement. Will you please join me in welcoming the 11th president of Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, Dr. Thomas Parham. Good morning. Let me uh, first of all say thank you to uh, Bill and the entire um, LA Economic Development team for uh, putting this forum on. Um, this is fabulous. And while I am the 11th president and honored and delighted to be in this particular role, I'm delighted really uh, please take a message and let them know that I can't, right? Um, I'm delighted to know that California State University Dominguez Hills is in fact a co-sponsor with this for the third year, right? That's an applause line, third year is that we're doing this. Even as we host, I think, what is the first of four of these forums that we'll do, I think, during the year. That's important. Um, as Bill said, I am the 11th president, not number eight. Um, because there were two interims in there that we try to give credit for as well, of what is one of 23 campuses in the California State University system. Uh, we are the largest system of public higher education in the nation. We take a backseat to nobody as we educate tomorrow's workforce. Some 490,000 students come through the doors of the 23 campuses, Cal State University, Dominguez Hills being one of them. And I'm honored and blessed to be in this role and to be able to do this particular work. Now, as Bill said, we are engaged in training America's workforce, absolutely. But we must help them stay on the cutting edge. We've got to help them to create that, that, that sense of, of, of innovation and aliveness to be able to engage what are the central issues of our time and not simply get stuck in spaces that allow them to do what is traditional and then graduate unprepared to be able to accept the challenges of an emerging workforce that is literally changing by the minute. So we are delighted to be able to do that. So as we prepare our students to meet the challenges right, of this day, these particular forms are absolutely essential to be able to do that. And to talk today particularly about financial technology, FinTech, how appropriate is that? as the way, right, the world is changing with that. And with all the experts that we have with us today, uh, we are uh, helping to support this, of course, with also our students in our College of Business. So I'd like to recognize certainly our deans who are here. So deans, wave up. So there's Dean Wynn and Dean LaPolt and <laughs> Dean Avila, <clears throat> who steward, right, the major schools that produce Right? a lot of this workforce talent with this magnificent faculty that I have the pleasure of working with every day. 
Uh, we also have a stellar group of administrators and vice, chance, uh, vice presidents, I should say, who are engaged in doing that work. So we are just delighted. But all of this is really about a team. And so our ability to come together and work with right, the LADC is for us right, a treasured strategic partnership. But a strategic partnership that we hope will only grow. We don't come to just be a convenient partner and we kind of work with stuff. We go to try to be on the cutting edge. I manage to try to set the curve, not follow the leader. So if we can set the curve in forms like this, we're delighted. Now lastly, I want to say that forms like this are not opportunities for us to simply come and summarize what are emerging trends. If that's all we do, I think we have not done our job. Our task, our task today is to be able to disrupt all of us who are in this room and who are viewing this right via whatever technological innovation they have in their space, to disrupt them from that comfortable category of intellectual, emotional, and behavioral apathy that has them just content to do things the way they've always been rather than really adjust to the changing marketplace that demands that we have new technology and new innovation that helps us not just disrupt it because we want to do that, but that helps us do it better and more efficiently so that we can then take the rightful place of rulership and mastery over this place we call our life space, right? And to do that in this county, to do that for these residents, to do that for these corporations and businesses is what we want to do. And California State University wants to partner with you to be on the cutting edge because we are that university that ought to be the place where these topics become critical discourse and analysis, where these topics are the things that we engage in on a regular basis. So we are just pleased and thankful and grateful to be co-sponsoring with you. So Bill, it is my pleasure to be here. Thank you for all of us for uh, being here today. And let's get crack a lacking on what it is that we're going to learn today. I'm interested in Penn Tech. What a great charge President Parham has given us, a great way to start the day. Thank you so much. Um, to set the context for the conversations we're going to have, we've prepared a, a video for you here, so please turn your attention to the video screen. This is the near future. Some things have changed, but not the coffee. No, the coffee is still the same. They grow it far away from Europe. They ship it in, roast it, grind it, and press water through it until it's a tasty kickstarter for the day. But the things that are in place to provide this nice cup of coffee, well, that's a different story. Ben here knows all about it. This is his favorite place for having coffee and working place too. He is a financial advisor. Did you see that? You just witnessed a grinder ordering coffee beans. It's now waiting for approval. And it's done. We do that a lot these days. It's like a very, very personal signature. This roasting company started using blockchain for all their transactions a few years ago. It was already popular for a while back then. And they started using a self-driving car service for the transportation of their beans. I remember the old days when paper was the main ingredient for trade finances. You know, for financing cargo. Oh boy, you could build a city out of the amount of trees that were spent that way. Luckily, it's all blockchain now. Yes, there's still a lot of banking, but not many banks. There are now many more services for transactions than five years ago. And for lending, Oh, don't get me started. I can get credit almost everywhere, even me. Can you imagine? <laughs> There's a lot that people can do for themselves these days. Funding their own ideas, using capital from their friends or clients. Technology has changed everything, and so fast that not everyone has been able to keep up. These past few years, banks have had a rough time adapting to the new world. They were busy with new regulations. Some were so distracted, they forgot to innovate. You can probably imagine what they went through.
It wasn't always a certainty that Ben's job would still exist today. A lot of people in the financial sector are now in IT. And Ben, well, Ben is good with people. I'm happy he's still here though. What would they do without him? Consumers have become a lot more demanding and financially wise. Nowadays, people take the time to compare every detail of a mortgage. Find out all the best bits from the banks, lending clubs, crowdfunding platforms, and wanting it all at once. Cherry picking is what we used to call this. And just when you think you have it all sorted, they come up with some more wishes. It takes people skills to deal with these new breed of consumer and good products and services, of course. Well done, Ben. This is the near future. Things have changed. In the financial sector, customers are at the center of attention again. I'm happy with that. Some banks have come around they are the ones that started to understand the new business economics and answered to the new competition. It's a lively world with these new ones around. I must say that the banks that are still here, they really reinvented themselves. Oh, sorry folks, I forgot. We were talking about coffee. Well, the coffee is still the same. But the financial sector, that's a different story. I invited the director of the Financial Services Digital Group at PricewaterhouseCoopers, Justin O'Connor, who has over 18 years of consulting operations and technology experience in the financial services industry to set the context for us today. Justin has a long track record of success working with clients to define their digital strategy and execute operational uh, deliveries. Uh, Justin's primary areas of expertise are digital strategy and planning, customer experience definition, large-scale program execution and management, business process management, merger and system integration, analytics, business intelligence, and data governance. Uh, we've invited him to give us a global overview of fintech and how it's shaping innovation in the financial services sector. Uh, please join us uh, in welcoming our keynote speaker, Justin O'Connor. Everybody hear me okay? Um, I wish somebody had warned me that I was going to follow Dr. Parham. Um, just his resume alone, um, I should have been should have chosen something a later slot. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the LADC for the partnership that we have with PwC and uh, for having us here today and for asking me to speak. I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be here. Um, what I want to do today is. Um, and, and I love the way Dr. Parham kind of summed up that we should be thinking about disruption. We should be thinking about um, you know, how to do things different in the future. Um, and, and I think the, the, what, what I'm going to frame here today is really about um, the way I look at the world is a lot of through banking. And, uh, and we're, in a, we're also in a, a very large banking market on, here on the West Coast here in Los Angeles. Um, and fintechs, we, we're seeing a convergence between banking and fintechs where it's really tough to tell the difference between a fintech and a bank. And it used to be that um, you know, what banks have always done well was gather customers and deposits um, and serve customers in a very kind of analog way. And we've seen a flattening of technology that has allowed fintech to kind of really sprint into the market with a very focused approach to customers and it's really pushed banks to actually follow suit. So let's, a little brief kind of history around kind of where we've been and where we're going. Um, the, in the U, this is a very kind of US-centric view of what's happened in, 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 in the US and, and along with FinTech and banking, where you know, our market has been dominated by a few processing giants, FIS, Fiserv, who have really kind of stifled what's been happening in, in, in financial services just because of their scale, and banks have had an amazing amount of reliance on them to deliver technology. Um, so what you, where, where maybe if you're going to take a European view of this, they would, they would have kind of a couple of years ago already been in some of these spaces. Um, even now, we're seeing a lot of the innovation coming out of, of Europe where 
they're having trouble breaking into the U.S. market just because of how conservative our, our, our base is. Um, but really kind of where we are today is in this spot where we've kind of done the social media thing, we're, we're on, we've done the smartphone thing, you know, we've moved on to mobile, and now we're in this place where everybody's kind of starting to say, how can we, how can we take cost out with chatbots? How can we maybe start doing personalized advice and kind of differentiate? And, um, and that's really kind of what banks are struggling with these days is they're, every, every piece of data that they're looking at now is that overall engagement is declining. So I've got fintechs that are starting to, in large technology companies, Facebook, Amazon. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you use Amazon Pay, you don't even really know it. You've used it for a very long time. Um, the pieces of the ecosystem are starting to leave banks and they're kind of going to large technology companies. And so engagement with your bank is kind of slowly decreasing. Um, mobile has clearly kind of won. You have people who have really even disconnected their DSL lines where we used to have this ubiquitous kind of connection to the internet at home. People are cutting the cord on their phone, they're cutting their cord on the internet, and the phone, the thing that you have in your hand is really becoming the kind of primary way you use, you use banking. Um, when it comes to human contact, that's kind of really where the story changes and what's really kind of really messing with the way that banks really like to kind of operate, right? Um, it, 10 years ago, even five years ago, a US primary checking relationship could only be acquired if you had a branch right down your street. But now that number is really, really changing. But everybody says when we are doing our surveys, and all this data is based on a survey that we do every year around kind of how digital is being used by consumers, 82% of consumers still want to be, um, they still want some level of human contact. I know that I really hate it when I need to talk to somebody and I get the IVR or the chat bot or whatever and I just slam on zero 10 times until I get the person. <laughs> but I'm also the person that I do, if you make me go into a branch, I'm even more upset. Like a branch is a waste of time for me. I've never met my financial advisor. The last mortgage I did was completely remote. Um, you know, and so I think banks are really struggling with now, how do I differentiate in the marketplace against all these fintechs and all this competition as people are using the branch less? The, the human banker used to make, make a lot of decisions, right? Contextual decisions around who this person is, what do they need, what do they need to do, and now we're removing that. And so what banks are really struggling with and where fintech really comes in to solve a lot of these problems is how can they contextually allow them to fill in some of these capability gaps that, that banks seem to have. Um, so when banks are looking at kind of how they're gonna grow, so, so what we're seeing is um, basically a, a, a shift where a couple years ago when we start looking at, so what this, this is an actual deliverable for a, a US regional client based on the East Coast, they're in about 25 states and they're looking to expand nationally. And when they start doing that, we basically look at, try to tell them, okay, so if you're gonna grow, you gotta focus on customers. We're in a customer-centric banking market. Everybody's, everybody's expectations of what they're gonna experience on their handheld, on their mobile, is going to increase over time. And so what we look at is say, if you're gonna expand, how are you gonna survive? Who are you gonna go after? And so we start looking at is value to the bank, which is um, investable assets, multiples of accounts, mortgages, and then digital acquisition propensity. How likely are those people to forego a branch and go after something that's a digital onboarding, you know, a full digital servicing, never see anybody, just a full digital experience? This is where, this is where fintechs and banks are spending all of their trying, trying to capture this. These are multiple product customers who use digital channels, which are pennies on the transaction, and this is, this is what everybody is fighting over. So, um, and, and this is what we're trying to, and this is, this is, um, this is, this is kind of, it's this area, and then you have your, your high potentials that are gonna move up into a high value customers over time, your students who are gonna get jobs and mature over time. So, banks have struggled with trying to uh, expand nationally and also gain traction with um, new generations of consumers. And so what we've seen is, and this is where the line blurs between FinTech and banking, 
we've seen banks start to um, either launch their own fintech companies, or we've seen fintech, fintech companies become banks. So this is, these are digital banking archetypes that we see coming out. So your non-traditional banks are either in execution complexity and also just complexity in how this is done. We see a lot of pure point financial, for example, digital deposit gathering strategies. So I'm going to acquire customers based on a rate, and I'm going to stand up a new digital bank parallel to my bank and just to kind of increase my balance sheet. What we're seeing more of, and this is where the, we blur the line between fintech and banking, is, um, is the financial advice um, type of startup where a full stack financial technology company that's basically seen a huge gap in how consumers are being banked to, and they're saying, we can do this better. We can focus in on a very specific customer segment. We can add a value proposition around a student, an employee, uh, a, uh, somebody, somebody who has a family, and, and really do it better. So you have your number 26 out of Germany, Varro, based here in California, which are, you know, very basic products, but that give you a lot of benefits in terms of planning, uh, payments, everything is free, no ATM charges, the service is outstanding. They're, they're, they have no operational costs. Everything is about marketing and then service. And so the feel of these banks are very different. So the reaction to this from these banks is, Finn gets launched by Chase, Greenhouse by Wells Fargo. Um, and and this, is, this, is, this is where kind of the whole thing is going. So what, it, so what does this mean for banks? Banks now, since fintechs are born and they're, they're basically attacking customer need and they're looking at a very specific customer and saying, how can I solve this problem, no matter what it is. And so what banks need to do is kind of shift from a traditional banking mindset, which is um, if you've ever had the experience with a bank that you call up to talk about a deposit account and then they say, oh, you're going to call about your loan, I've got to transfer you over here. That's, these are essentially five different lines of business. What customers are now demanding is a customer-centric approach, and this is where banks are trying to get to. The fintech companies that are being started up now, they're already customer-centric. They were born focusing on one specific customer, and now they're growing radically. So banks are now faced with this, this opportunity, and this is where we get into how do banks and fintech start working together. So, and this is the hardest pivot for a bank because they naturally like to diversify their risk and try to appeal to everybody at the same time, which is antithetical to how a, uh, a startup will work. And we're going to hear that from some of the other panelists today. But what segments are we going after? What's the value proposition we're going to be providing? What are the products and services? And what are the capabilities? And the capabilities that you need to drive is really kind of where banks and fintechs can start to play together. Fintechs are going to provide some sort of capability, whether it's personetics and, uh, or some of the other fintechs. They, the capabilities that are the gaps, this is where banks really need fintech's help in order to kind of round out their offering. So to recap, customer expectations are increasing and banks and fintech companies need to really kind of catch up and, and, and make sure that, they're up, uh, that they are providing the services that customers need. And today's consumers are totally focused on financial goals, but we're still not giving them the intuitive, am I going to be able to retire? Am I going to be able to accomplish my goals? It's still a math game around how much, how much am I making? How much have I saved? What, it, what do I am I going to need to retire? It's still a guessing game for, for the consumers. Um, so the fintech companies are, so this is, this is our view of, of of fintech right now, especially when it comes to banking. Um, so you have the pro traditional FS technology companies, Pfizer, Visa, First Data. These are the ones that have kind of always been in fintech before fintech was even fintech. You have your traditional financial services institutions. You have your, you now with their, their, the new fancy new term is FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Um, and then you have your kind of pure play uh, financial service, uh, financial fintech companies, kind of next generation. The two years ago when I wrote this slide, I would have said that the, the, the area that's most in danger of disruption 
would be the financial services technology companies because these are the, the incumbent technology companies of really kind of the behemoth, slow moving, slow to market, can adapt. These, these are the ones that are most, but now we're seeing that the financial institutions are also at risk. So when you see Amazon starting to take over payments, Apple the same way, you're starting to see pieces of the value chain that banks used to traditionally rely upon and they're disappearing. So how do, the big difference, so, you, so remember the, as banks are trying to pivot from this very kind of siloed methodology where they're very product focused and outside in, inside out rather than outside in, um, fintech companies are really kind of focusing on the, 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 in, the outside in approach, right? They're focusing on what's the problem, how do I solve it? So I focus on where, what's the single product or single thing I can focus on? Then once they're successful, that they're going to look for adjacencies and where to move next. And then they're going to pivot quickly and fill that space. And so just sort of background, like why is this happening now? So about 10 years ago, um, you know, we really saw, you know, first, second generation technology was very expensive, very tough to deploy. Cloud really wasn't around yet. And so what we saw was, um, you know, basically a flattening of, um, of op open source frameworks come out where APIs are much easier to use, scaled cloud computing, and developers on demand. And so all of a sudden, you're, no matter what is happening with the investment, your overall cost to actually deploy is, is much cheaper. And now um, we're seeing that now it's a complete maturation of the market where you know, deal size, global fintech investment, 2014, 2017, 19 billion with an 18% CAGR. And so that, but the deal sizes keep going down. So as we're seeing more and more investment, deal sizes are going down, deals, the actual deals are going down. So you're just seeing larger and larger deals because these businesses are really getting scale. Um, and I think overall, we're gonna continue to see um, customer disruption in these three areas. So value chain enhancement, I think we're gonna hear a lot today about um, digital banks, robo-advisors, um, and, and blockchain. Um, you're gonna see industry disruption, peer-to-peer um, -peer lending, omni-channel capabilities, and then still the, cons the customer is gonna keep evolving. We're gonna see the branch, the, the branches are gonna, it's gonna be interesting, it's interesting to see how it plays out where a lot of banks are still kind of putting out their branches of the future, but we're, we're, are, are they gonna be, are, is that gonna be a necessary cost? Are they gonna be needed in the future? Um, most of what's coming out these days, if it's a FinTech company that's, that's, that's launching a full service bank, SoFi is a great example, started with lending, now they're chartering for deposits, um, they have a wealth offering. There's no branch at SoFi. They have an amazing customer service center. They have, they've created, they've done a really good job of um, creating a social network. If you become a member there, you're gonna get a Facebook page with people who are going to reach out to you with networking events and coaching on how to advance your career. And you know, the face-to-face -face contact never exists, and it's um, and and their their NPS scores, the things that people are saying about them, it's just not needed. So, our our hypothesis is that banks are going to continue to try to need new capabilities, and fintechs. It, what we're saying clear out is that fintechs are are kind of part of this solution on how they're going to get there. Um, what they need to really kind of focus on is making sure that they're evaluating emerging technology. So third generation core technologies um, are, are, that, are, that are really fintechs that, to help them kind of grow and build faster. They need to move, from partner, to move from mergers to partnerships. This has been an evolving story. A couple years ago, this was you know, a very, um, I would say, uh, the way that banks were considering these things were, this is my enemy, right? And now you're seeing their partnerships, like this is actually how I'm gonna act, survive. I need to be able to, I, I, I can't spend, I don't have the innovation budget 
to go out and do this. So fintechs are, I mean, billions of dollars of R&D is happening right on your doorstep in LA, San Francisco, New York. All you need to do is figure out what's your strategy for how you're going to serve your customers and be able to partner quickly. Um, the big, uh, huge shift for, for the banks, and it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out, can they actually go outside in? Your traditional bank has always been, I've got a mortgage. Here's your 30-year. Take it when you get it. The new model and how we all want to be, what we want to be uh, presented to is inside out. Get me when I am in need. My, my favorite story um, is uh, my daughter is 18 months old. And I, we have, so 18 months ago, having a baby, I'm reading the books, how to be a good dad, all the things that I need to do. I have about 10 banking relationships. Um, some of them are fintechs. And not one company called me. Nobody reached out to me. Nobody kind of said, hey, what's, uh, what's going on? How can I help you? Is it, uh, you know, what, what, are you, what are your needs and where are you at? Um, meanwhile, Amazon was um, pounding my wife and I for subscriptions, subscriptions on diapers and wipes and all kinds of things. Pandora, because I'm cheap and I never paid for the, the, uh, the subscription, it was a change. All of our ads changed drastically to... <laughs> a bunch of ads I never, and they knew, like they absolutely knew that we were there um, and, um, and, and none of the banks picked up on it. And all of our spending data, if you looked at it, is you know, pretty easy to see that, that we, were, we were prepping, right? We're nesting. Um, and I actually spoke to a, a, head of, a leader of a bank in Canada who they were, um, he, uh, they, they had just done a large transformation and we're just asking a question around um, you know, what the benefits were. And I told him this story and he basically said the same thing. He goes, I've had three kids. I, I run retail for this bank. No, we have a thing called a baby bundle. Nobody's ever called me to see if I want it. And, and this is where I think banks are going to really have to kind of switch. And this is where we get to outside in design thinking where I need to think about my customers and where they are, and I need to get them where they are. That's, that is where, you know, if anybody had reached out to me in that time, I would have changed every single banking relationship at that time. You know, that, that is what, that's the service that I wanted, never got it. Um, and I think, you know, fintechs at this point are just reaching scale, so I'm not, not holding their feet to the fire yet. Um, and, and a lot of them are so small that they're still in the kind of the value chain. They're not looking at a full service bank. Um, but they are much better. They're they're going outside in in their DNA, and it's just going to be a huge advantage over time. Um, and I think the last piece was going to be, um, you know, you know, I think when thinking about skills of the future and things that are, you know, if you have if you have large institutions that are going to be figuring out what they need to do in order to serve those clients figuring out how they're going to serve those customers and finding those operational and capability gaps. So I need something for payments or I need something for, um, for uh, personal finance. You know, a lot of most, and I think you'll see this industry-wide, that a lot of banks now with the way that things are architected with, you know, easy-to-access APIs that you're just going to be integrating to new capabilities and then fit, trying to figure out how to share the revenue and share. Um, and these aren't, these aren't technology plays. These are revenue strategies, right? I have, I, have a, um, I have a capability. You have a capability. Let's partner to do a joint offering, and then we'll figure out how to share the revenue. Um, we're going to be better going together than we are separately. And you know, people's ability, you know, development capabilities, this is, this is one of those areas from an educational perspective. If you can understand architecture, if you can build integration, this is, this is one of those things that's going to be just high need for a long period of time. And I think the last, the last piece I would say that is lacking for banks is this. It's also a theme of outside-in design thinking is that uh, we have this philosophy called BXT, which means we're really good. And, and when we're talking about large businesses, the business capabilities and outcomes is the easy conversation. And then we instantly skip to the technology and say, all right, how are we going to do this? But the thing that it, this, that if you don't do the outside in design thinking, you miss the experience. And the experience and how this, these applications get consumed and how somebody's going to experience your product, if you don't have that, usually not great outcomes. And, and this is what you see with 
you know, kind of groundbreaking technology. They've, t they've, they've looked at the business outcomes, they've got great technology, and they've been very thoughtful about the experience. Um, very difficult for banks. FinTechs also have a huge advantage, but even sometimes the FinTechs don't do that very well. So I think, you know, the bank of the future, banks of the future, whether it's a commercial or consumer, are gonna be, it's, this is gonna be about financial advice. The, the, the accounts are, should be disappearing behind goals and what I'm trying to accomplish and the next best action and how can I help and what's important to me and not seeing just a list of accounts that kind of show me you know, where my balances are. Um, we're, we're, I think fintechs are really gonna be able to help banks engage clients off bank where they've really been on bank. If, if, uh, if the banks had ever reached me off bank to find out whether or not I was having a baby and what help I needed, they would have won a lifetime customer. Um, education, advice, goal setting, all those things are gonna be embedded um, and, and FinTech is gonna be kind of the, it's gonna be the engine that's gonna probably make that happen. And I think, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that there are, you know, an amazing amount of still unbanked people in the U.S. and international. And I think the conversation for both fintechs and banks in the U.S. has to kind of pivot closer to how do we close those gaps. Um, and there's, the progress has been made, but you still have, you know, two billion people underbanked in the, in the world. Um, and, and progress is being made, but it's just not drastic enough. Thank you. Justin, that was terrific. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, really, thank you so much, Justin, for setting the table, not only for this conversation about fintech, but giving us things to think about uh, in all of the industries that are represented here today. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, we've assembled a terrific group of experts on this subject uh, to address you this morning and engage in some conversation amongst themselves and take your questions. And to lead us through the next parts uh, of the program, I'd like to introduce the woman on our team who really conceived of and helped establish this Future Forum series, a forward-thinking colleague of mine, our Vice President for Strategic Relations, Elsa Flores. Thank you so much, Bill. And I am thrilled to have the opportunity to moderate a fireside chat with our featured speaker this morning. She is managing partner for Stillmark Company and Stillmark Capital, a venture capitalist with stage, uh, a seed stage to pre-IPO investment in infrastructure, enterprise, and consumer technologies, and one of the very first traditional venture capitalists to participate as an investor and advisor to the blockchain and cryptocurrency ecosystems. Elise Colleen was one of the initial few VCs to delve into token incentivized software based networks and token sales in 2013. She is an advisory board chairperson to one of the very first companies ever to host such a token distribution. Prior to Stillmark, Elise was an investor with two of Los Angeles' largest and most esteemed venture capital firms. Please join me in welcoming Elise Colleen. Our mics, are we good? Great. Thank you. Such an honor. Thank Thanks you for so having me for here. I'm excited to be at Future Forum with you. Thank you. So I'm just going to point out the obvious. So you're a woman in fintech, and you're a woman in venture capitalist. So tell us a little bit about that. You're definitely atypical. So how do you how'd you get involved, and how do you then support an atypical investor or venture capitalist? Sure. So I was coming into venture capital from a research um, and analytics background. I had done an initial, a first master's degree studying immunology and uh, you know, running regression modeling, being trained in statistics and research, and also publishing and writing. And so, and then started, came back to LA to pursue my second master's degree in MBA. And in that process, I thought that I would be an entrepreneur. Both of my grandfathers were, and I thought I'd go to business school and um, launch a company of my own. And it would be smart for me to meet local VCs. Mm. And so I, I um, started out, set out to do that. And one of the first groups that I met with, Clearstone Venture Partners, um, saw my background in research and stats um, and the foundation that was set there and 
mathematics and research and also in writing and invited me uh, to join as an intern initially. Mm. And so that's how I got in. So it wasn't, it wasn't much of the hustle that you can hear about mm. sometimes from others and it wasn't even necessarily intentional, but it was aligned with my, with my background quite accidentally. Fantastic. Um, tell us a little bit about the venture capital uh, currently and how is venture capital different in the Bitcoin and blockchain field? Sure. So we, so as you mentioned in the intro, I started looking at the Bitcoin and blockchain as an infrastructure space in 2013. Mm -hmm. And so, and it had started in venture capital the year before. And in our practice um, at Clearstone at that time, we spent much time on enterprise technology, on fintech, and on infrastructure generally and broadly. And so we were looking at things like um, software that, that would regulate function of data centers or mm -hmm. cloud networking um, and the like. Mm -hmm. And so when I came across blockchain, I saw it just simply as an infrastructure mm -hmm. that could provide differentiated and very unique um, value both to enterprise and to users through, mm -hmm. through different applications that would be, um, you know, even potential to introduce per the stage of development of the infrastructure itself. And so that's what's different about blockchain um, investing than other venture investing because when we invest in the blockchain space in a company or application that's based on this blockchain infrastructure, mm -hmm. we have to make sure that we consider, consider the stage of maturity of the infrastructure mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. And so our, our last speaker, Justin O'Connor, talked a little bit about open source development and of course, Bitcoin and blockchain um, is an open source development initiative. And so what that really means practically when you're a founder building on top of such an infrastructure is that your technical team exists in part outside and external to your company mm -hmm. um, and also outside and external to your own control and leadership. And so in the blockchain space, when VCs are investing or angel investors or institutions, corporations are looking where to partner or where to invest, they need not only to evaluate the team, but also the external open source development team that that company's work um, is, is essentially based upon and the stage of maturity of the blockchain technology itself, not just the company. Mm -hmm. What are some of the companies that you're investing in right now? Sure. So, in well, first, I'd love to share um, a bit about one of the first investments mm -hmm. that we made, and um, I'll, I'll talk about a recent investment as well. So, in 2014, um, we invested in a company called Blockstream, which has um, historically been known as the blockchain and Bitcoin um, focused company that has accumulated the highest number of. Bitcoin scientists and developers on the team. So it was a, a highly technical, all technical team mm -hmm. at the time almost, um, and remains so. And what they were focused on then and continue to be focused on today was actual development and progression of the infrastructure itself and the different layers of infrastructure that could be built to help enterprise um, and, and small business, small and medium sized businesses as well actually make use of the technology. Um, and so one of the applications or one of the use cases that they've designed um, in these past few years is uh, what's known as a federated side chain. And this side chain is called Liquid. Mm -hmm. And what Liquid does is actually targeting financial institutions to create enterprise scale liquidity quickly mm -hmm. and only making use of the blockchain when it's needed and actually adds value to the transaction. Um, so they've, they've created sort of a refined space for institutions to make use of, of the value without having to face as much of the friction um, or punishment that can sometimes come from using a blockchain. Most recently, we made an investment in a company called Chia Network, which is founded by Ryan Singer and Bram Cohen. And Bram's name you might know because he was the technical founder of BitTorrent. Mm -hmm. And what they, are, what they are building is actually a new blockchain infrastructure that's focused on, um, on decentralization through creating a diseconomy of scale to mining. So something that we've seen as we watched the Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrency ecosystems mature is that the way that mining, which is essentially um, a security element or uh, function, 
of the blockchain, the way mining is incentivized has encouraged kind of larger conglomerations to form and for few institutions to be um, disproportionately powerful. Mm -hmm. And so Chia Network is creating a new blockchain that's, that, that disallows that and disincentivizes that sort of behavior. And because we believe, because Stillmark believes in the value of decentralization and full decentralization, mm -hmm. Chia Network was um, you know, an interesting and um, exciting opportunity uh, to, to take part in. That round was led by Naval from um, AngelList mm -hmm. and had participation from firms like Andreessen Horowitz and, um, and, and other notable Sandhill names. Mm -hmm. uh, for the first investment that you talked about um, in regards to the blockchain in 2014, are banks, do you find that banks are receptive to these new technologies and new companies? I think that's shifting. Mm -hmm. um, and in part, it's shifting um, perhaps out of, out of, will shift out of necessity mm -hmm. by demographic and cultural changes or pushes. Um, okay. So for instance, as I saw our last speaker referencing the current trends of unbundling services or values mm -hmm. gained um, traditionally at banks and fintech companies kind of pulling apart pieces to provide loan ability or savings or financial advisory mm -hmm. through mobile phone, um, and then and, and then he referenced, of course, the natural trend towards once scale is gained at a fintech company mm -hmm. and the consumer base is broad enough, mm -hmm. there's an incentive and, um, and capability to be able to branch out and then to rebundle services. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we'll see some of that driven by cryptocurrency companies and entities that's, that were startups as recent as just a couple years ago that have become huge organizations that almost represent financial institutions for those that have used them, right? So for Gen Z and, and for younger millennials. So a company like Coinbase, for instance, was one of the first ways that you could purchase and um, store Bitcoin. And, and frankly, to Gen Z and younger millennials, that can that has seemed to be, for some, more exciting and even more trustworthy than storing value traditionally in, in fiat and banks. And so as we see Coinbase and Coinbase competitors grow and scale mm -hmm. and also have a strong brand with their user base, mm -hmm. it, I, I think it, it stands to reason that banks could want to share some of that space as, as well. What I'm hearing from banks and financial institutions generally is that higher net worth clients are beginning to ask and push mm -hmm. for a way to, for banks to hold custodianship. So one of the things I think that's fairly well known at this point is that it's quite hard to actually hold or store cryptocurrency for the average user um, or even for a, a technically sophisticated user. And that has been something that's held back institutions, including family offices, mm -hmm. from, from coming into the space. And some of those family offices, what I'm understanding from friends and partners in the mm -hmm. traditional banking system, are beginning to push for custodianship to be offered by the banks that they, they themselves have learned to trust. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, mm -hmm. traditional traditional banking will be uh, feeling influence from both sides, both from Gen Z that has learned to trust and store value with Coinbase, um, and from very traditional offices that want some exposure to cryptocurrency but don't want to custodian or can't custodian it themselves. Mm. Okay. Um, just going back a little bit uh, on, the, on the overall fintech kind of on uh, the blockchain ecosystem, can you tell us a little bit more about how important that is just for the future of technology in general. And then if you can talk a little bit and touch upon, you've been in Los Angeles as a venture capital investor. How does LA play a role in that space? Where are you investing? Is it LA companies? Are they here? Sure. So that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be at Future Forum today um, and to listen to the, the prior um, and coming speakers. So it was interesting it's been interesting to hear a reference to training and exciting to hear about the training of a workforce for the innovation that's arising from the city and, and even more broadly. What I saw um, when I started out in venture capital was that there was also a little bit of the flip happening in LA where you know, LA trains the largest number of undergraduate engineers in the country um, and has incredible numbers of both master and PhD level engineering 
students as well. But we've historically had just a terrible time at retaining that talent. Um, and when you talk to students, um, or the students at the schools that I speak to, share that they have felt like they've had a terrible time getting to know the community. Mm -hmm. And I now I mean the startup and um, tech corporation community of LA. And so I'm interested in what I've focused on for the past couple years in my spare time outside of um, my venture capital work is on making sure that the students that are actually at the frontier of technology on campus and, and discovering new tech uh, both on the life sciences side and on the computer sciences side in labs at UCLA, USC, um, at, at, at the public institutions um, that go beyond those two as well and at Caltech that we want to make sure to retain the, that talent have that leadership stay in LA and, and both as entrepreneurs themselves and then as entrepreneurs at, at our local companies. And so the side project that I referenced is something mm -hmm. called City Fellows Consortium, uh, which is live now at Caltech, USC, and UCLA. And what we do there is we look for um, a top level of talent that has shown initiative outside of class to be doing research in the lab, to be um, working at startups in their summers off or with professors. Mm -hmm. And we bring students into startups in LA or into larger corporations like Snap um, and also to venture capital offices. And so we do that on a monthly basis so they can start to understand the resources that are available in LA mm -hmm. for them um, to continue working on what in interests them. And the idea is that that's one of the fuels that will drive LA's ecosystem. Fantastic. And I think we talked a little bit earlier, you were saying there is about 50% women that are part of that. Right. Yep. So we, so the, the only screening mechanism for the program is that there's been um, evidence of distinction in, um, you know, their potential to be leaders in their professional communities in the future, mm -hmm. and that they've shown an inclination to want to use talent for social or cultural good. And so with those two screening criteria, um, we just we naturally have a diverse group. So last year, the group that graduated was um, maybe 55% women. There was more women than men in the group. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also is relatively culturally diverse as well. Fantastic. It's great to hear. So I've got, oh my gosh, we got one minute. OK, so for the people in the room right now, if there's somebody in here with a really good idea about a blockchain, <laughs> idea or fintech product, how can they get to you? How can they get to you to pitch you? And what advice would you give them? Do you give different advice to men or to women, depending on you know, what it's like for them to be in that space? Yeah, so, so just to follow along the lines of the question you asked um, a couple times around women and contribution to the ecosystem and founders. We, uh, so Stillmark's investment, our, our pipeline is pretty well known in terms of what checks we'll be writing months in advance. So maybe three to four months in advance. And I think in our next set of three to four investments, uh, the CEOs of those companies will, will be half women and half men. And mm -hmm. again, this is just, um, it's by way of who has, has produced the most interesting work, mm -hmm. gone after markets that are largest um, and that have a vision and a plan as well that, that allows them to execute upon that vision. Um, for founders that want to reach out, we the website of stillmark.co um, is very, uh, you know, unencumbered with information, except mm -hmm. that there's um, an email link that allows you to reach out. Um, for, for founders. Um, is that really and, the best way to do it? Just a cold email saying I've got some ideas? Well, those, so it's a, we have, it's a small team, less than a handful of people, and so we all see mm -hmm. all of the emails. And I, I believe in cold outreach, and no, most people don't, but I think that you know, expecting a warm intro from every founder creates um, a dynamic where only well-connected you know, or generally privileged founders um, have access. And there's a lot of great founders that are privileged, but there's also a lot of great founders that don't have those networks. And we certainly don't want to miss out on those opportunities. Um, in fact, those opportunities, frankly, are more exciting. If we get a mm -hmm. chance to see something first and then to bring it into our network of investors rather than vice versa, that's even more exciting. And historically, at the firms that I worked at prior to Stillmark, we found great companies from cold inbound. And so I've, I've been trained that way my first years mm -hmm. in venture um, 
showed me to have great respect for cold inbound and for founders that ha take the initiative to do that and still Mark maintains the same value system on That's that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. And uh, she will, you're going to stay with us for the end of the panelists and then we'll have questions from the audience. So hold on to those questions. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker uh, here to share about case studies around blockchain and cryptocurrency technology and its usage across industries is Managing Director of Republic Crypto and partner at Torion Capital. Please welcome Brian Mint. Uh, how's it going? How are you guys all doing? Awesome. I'm really happy to be here, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I'm from LA originally. Uh, but I live in San Francisco now, so i uh, super honored to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Rick. And thank you, uh, Vanessa, for inviting me to be here. Uh, really excited and honored. Um, let's see. Oh, I think, uh, oh, forward. Forward. There it is. OK, so uh, for those of you that don't know, um, I'm Managing Director at Republic. Uh, as Elise mentioned, uh, you mentioned of all word, you, Elise. Uh, you mentioned that you knew Naval. Uh, we're a, a, a part of AngelList, actually. Uh, we, Naval is one of our advisors. And if you guys are familiar with the company CoinList, uh, they are also our sister company in the crypto space. So I'm here to kind of talk about blockchain technology, not from a VC standpoint, but more on a technological standpoint and an application standpoint. Uh, for those of you that were at my previous talk um, at the LA Chamber, this is a very similar presentation, but I did update it a little bit to be more focused on um, kind of larger scale businesses and larger scale applications of crypto and blockchain technology. So the point of this uh, talk here today is by the end uh, of my presentation, uh, I want you guys to all be able to understand blockchain and crypto on a fundamental level, technologically, and also use cases for applying uh, blockchain technology in businesses and also just like in general, like think of where it can be applied in life. Because blockchain is not just about, not a business tool, it can be applied for many other aspects as well. And then I'll touch a little bit on the current state of the blockchain ecosystem, uh, where we are in terms of regulation. This is this very new and frothy space. So there's a lot of stuff happening. Like I think yesterday Walmart just announced that they're going to be using blockchain for one of their supply chain management solutions. So uh, that's like pretty huge deal. And also the SEC, you know, has always been saying things about what are securities, what are not securities, how do we regulate sales, and things like that. So I'll touch a little bit on that as well. Okay, so I'm going to go over crypto. I'm going to go over the business use cases, uh, the landscape, and review. So on a high level, uh, cryptocurrencies and tokens are built on blockchain. So when, I, when people say crypto, when people say blockchain, when people say Bitcoin, uh, those are all very different things, but they all are used very interchangeable, interchangeably. But I just want to make some distinctions really quickly. Uh, blockchain is the actual technology that everything is built on top of. Blockchain... Blockchains are typically encrypted using cryptographic means, so that's why cryptocurrencies, which are built on top of blockchains, are called cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin, uh, one of the most prevalent use cases of blockchain, uh, is a cryptocurrency. So when, that's why people typically associate Bitcoin with blockchain, but Bitcoin does not equal blockchain. So you're not using Bitcoin technology, you're using blockchain technology. Applications being built on blockchain, you know, these are the kind of the main attributes to blockchain technology that make it as disruptive and as prevalent as it is today. Uh, they are secure, decentralized, open source, and slow, right? Keyword here is slow, but people are working on this. Uh, and on another, like, encompassing all of this, blockchain is basically a new way to store data, right? It's a database architecture that very much like, uh, you know, Kind of like Excel, you have a you have your database stored in Excel. Blockchain is kind of like that. It's just somewhere where you can store bits and pieces of information, but the information that you store will be secure because it's cryptographically um, enhanced. It's decentralized, typically speaking, uh, because there are many different nodes that work together to secure the system instead of having you know your computer running Excel to store the database. It's open source. Uh, you can see exactly what's going on, you know, under the hood of the application. Uh, this is, again, these are very general terms. There are blockchains that are not decentralized, and there are also blockchains that are not open source. But on a, you know, general level, uh, blockchains are typically open source, meaning 
because every there are many different distributed nodes, then people can see what's happening in everyone else's node. That makes it open source, and you can see the code that's being run, and that makes the technology very transparent. Uh, speaking of banks, or maybe thinking about Facebook, if you had a blockchain version of a bank, you can, in theory, see you know, the transactions that are happening. You can, in theory, see the balances of the different addresses. You might not be able to trace it back to certain people, but you can see how much money is being is in the reserve of the bank, or you can see how much money is being sent on a daily basis because all of the information is open source. And it's not risky because it's also secured through the cryptography that's used in the, in the blockchain technology. Whereas, you know, in current day, if you just open sourced a bank, you know, you, you, know, you, you can see all the security vulnerabilities and potentially hack into it. Um, and that's why banks are not open source. Uh, I want to make a point here at the end, blockchains are slow. Uh, because of the way that they process transactions uh, serially, not in parallel, j to just, that's just a core infrastructure um, of blockchain. You, know, you, do, you, you store data in one block, and you store data in another block. You hash that, and you put in data in another block, and you, you store that data serially. Because you do that, it is a little bit slow. There are many projects working to enhance the scalability of blockchain technology, whether you're settling the blockchain transaction off the chain or you're thinking of ways to settle the transactions in parallel using uh, another method called uh, direct acyclic graphs. But in theory, or you know, for now in the current state, blockchains are not uh, extremely fast, and that is a hindrance to a lot of the applications today. Um, and one point I want to make is, you know, everyone's working on this right now. This is a really big and hot topic, but you, the reason why you don't see a lot of uh, companies using blockchain, you don't see a lot of banks adopting crypto, you don't see, you know, people just like building on it right away, a lot, at least a lot of the established companies, is because it's not ready for mainstream adoption yet. So let's talk about some applications that can happen in blockchain, in theory. Uh, I would say businesses don't need to be built on blockchain today, but they can benefit from services that use blockchain, right? So you, you, don't, you don't want to be building your entire business on blockchain, but there are certain applications that you can maybe like, uh, you can maybe branch into the blockchain or like tap into the blockchain uh, companies for your business. So for example, uh, static data registries, food origin. This is the Walmart example that uh, a few people have mentioned today. So. If you are Walmart, you're not going to be just building your whole financial infrastructure on crypto and blockchain. But if you want to be storing, you know, if you want to know the provenance of the food that you're ordering, you can use a, a supply chain uh, blockchain solution. And the reason why this is awesome is because if you're using a, a blockchain-based solution to store some food data, you can, in theory, track food from when it was bought or when it was grown. So say you want to track the origin of coffee, right? And you, I, I really like coffee, and I care that my coffee is made from Ecuador, and those beans have been processed in South America, and finally make their way into my cup. So how do I go to Walmart and ensure that that's happening? If the supply chain of the coffee beans has been tracked on, on the blockchain, you can, and it's open source, then you can see you know, at what points in time did it go, did it get picked, did it get processed in the manufacturing plant? Did it get distributed and shipped and finally make its way into the, the store? That, that can all be tracked and uh, validated uh, through blockchain um, in an open source way. Now, can that happen using closed systems today? In theory, it can. But the difference is that in the closed systems today, you have to kind of trust the owner of the system, the central authority, to not lie about that system. But because crypto is open source, you can, everyone can check and make sure that it's real. Uh, that's the value that it has, especially for a food supply chain. And I think that's why Walmart is thinking about doing this for their produce section. Uh, there's a few other applications here. I want to talk about digital uniqueness. Um, if you guys probably have all heard of CryptoKitties, why are CryptoKitties really cool? Uh, they're cool in theory, right? They're not cool because it's just a cat that you can store on your computer. But this is the first, one of the first times that you can actually own a digitally unique piece of 
the internet, right? Like in the past, if, you, if I sent you a picture on Facebook, now we both have a copy of that picture on Facebook. If I sent you an email, now we both have copies of that email. If I sent you a CryptoKitty, I no longer have that CryptoKitty, and you have that CryptoKitty. You're the only person in the world that has that CryptoKitty. Now think about maybe baseball cards, right? If you mint one rookie card for someone that you know, joins the MLB today, and you're the one per only person that has it, now it has value. And that can be applied to many other aspects of life. And having the ability to create digitally unique assets that are verifiable on the blockchain is a really interesting thing to think about. And for people that are building businesses, maybe like think about how you can leverage that in a way to build a unique business that was not enabled before. Right? That's what CryptoKitties did. Uh, let's talk a little bit about payments. Uh, you know, for in terms of banking, I think. Uh, Banks can be, banks are interesting because in the US you can only transact within the US for the most part, but with blockchain you can send money in the way that you can send email. And that is a really interesting point, right? That, that basically allows you to bank the unbanked in many different ways. What's going on today? I'm skipping over some details because I'm running a little bit short on time. Uh, what's happening today, uh, Bitcoin and Ether, which are the dominant cryptocurrencies, are deemed not securities by the SEC, which is pretty huge. Uh, that means that you're not going to be uh, penalized by the SEC for buying crypto on Coinbase. Um, there are tokens being sold and token sales and ICOs, which can potentially be deemed securities. So just be careful. Make sure you have the proper accreditation or you're you're going through the proper funding portals when you're raising money or when you're uh, trying to purchase on token sales. Token sales have been a really interesting way to raise money. Please see me after you guys have questions on how that happens. And if you guys want to do a token sale, uh, I can definitely assist you with that. Our platform at Republic is a way for people to do token sales and invest in token sales. Um, Large institutional companies are coming in. Uh, at least you mentioned Andreessen Horowitz. They just opened a $300 million fund dedicated to investing in crypto. So you'll start seeing institutional money flowing in, but it's not at a level where you know, everybody's getting in and everyone's jumping in at the moment. But because you're seeing this, like these institutional players come in, I think you'll see a lot more growth and a lot more interest in the next coming years. Uh, a lot of trends that are happening today, you know, feel free to ask me afterwards or during the panel. There's a lot of uh, focus on asset-backed security tokens. So if you are a fund and you want to tokenize the equity, you can do that through crypto and blockchain. There are things like airdrops and token economics where you can design tokens that you sell to, be, to incentivize certain activities that you're trying to do. So if you want people to you know, uh, stake tokens on your network or use tokens in a way that uh, incentivizes people to spend money only within your economy, then you can design certain economics around that using game theory and things like that. It's a very interesting space. So last slide here, uh, some takeaways. I would say we're still very, very early in the space. I think everybody kind of agrees this has probably been beaten to death. We're in the internet era of crypto, right? Not, nothing's being built that people can use in the mass market today. Uber hasn't even been thought of yet. Uh, real talent, real capital is flowing into the ecosystem. I would say most projects that are ready for mass market are at least a year out, at least. And blockchain is not the right solution for everything. Just think about you know, what really needs to be built on crypto and blockchain and not just like trying to find, not trying to create a solution, uh, find a solution looking for a problem. Uh, a lot of current businesses you know, if you guys are looking to use crypto, uh, please keep a pulse on what's happening and see what aspects of crypto that are mature that you can use for your company instead of building directly on it. And you know, just think, criti think creatively. You know, if you this is a very new system, very new technology, and I think the coolest uh, applications are these native applications of blockchain instead of like older companies trying to use blockchain, like pivot to blockchain. But if you think about what can be uh, thought of in a blockchain native mindset, then I think you can think of really, really cool companies. I don't know what they are because I haven't, you know, if I did, I wouldn't be here. I would probably be building that company. But I would encourage all of you to be thinking about these companies. All right. Thank you. Very exciting times. Thank you so much, Brian, for that. It was fantastic. Our next speaker is going to talk to us about technology that offers financial access to those living on the base of the socioeconomic pyramid around the globe. Please welcome big data analyst for Tala, Andrea Marcos. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Excited to connect with all of you later. Um, so my name is Andrea. I'm a credit manager at Tala. It's a fintech startup that provides short-term credit in emerging markets. In the next 10 minutes, I'll give you a brief context of what is the problem we're trying to solve. Um, I'll tell you how our technology works very briefly because we are short in time. But most of all, I want one of our customer stories to tell you the rest. Um, okay, so Tala. Tala's mission is to increase financial access, choice, and control for underserved people globally. Why? Well, only 31% of the adult population globally has a documented financial history. What does that mean? That 3 billion adults don't. So without this proper documented financial history, it's impossible for banks or typical financial institutions to understand and reach this 3 billion people, let alone design products for them. According to a McKinsey study, this represents a $2.1 trillion opportunity. But this opportunity will remain untapped if we cannot understand or reach this, uh, these customers. However, with the rise in smartphones, this gives us an opportunity to do both. We can understand consumers by looking at their mobile behavior, and we can reach them where it's most convenient to them. So as devices continue to decrease in price, smartphone penetration increases, especially in the developing world, where most of the growth we've seen over the last five years has been in China, India, and Sub-Saharan Africa. In 2017, the number of mobile subscribers passed 5 billion. Additionally, the number of people accessing the internet through a mobile phone has doubled over the past five years, and it's expected to reach 4.7 billion by 2020. So we see these trends, uh, both an unmet need for credit and the rising smartphone and internet penetration, as evidence that not only is there, is there a need to build solutions to meet this new emerging class of consumers, but that also the solution starts with leveraging technologies and tools that already exist. So Talus Innovation is in how we use data science to underwrite people with little or no financial history. So we designed an app that instantly underwrites people using a combination of phone and behavioral data to automatically disburse short-term credit. So that means that anyone with an Android phone in any of our markets can download the app, apply within five minutes, get an under, uh, instant decision, and get uh, credit, regardless of their financial history. So since we started lending in Kenya in 2014, We've expanded to five countries in three different continents. Why? Because we want to prove that our um, business model works across markets and that we can increase financial access, choice, and control globally. So in doing, though, in doing this, we've learned some key differences among our markets, but also some similarities. And that is why I want you to tell you this customer story. So let me share one of our customer stories, and I will ask you to like raise your hand in like three different stages of this customer's life to ask you what you would have done uh, in that situation. Okay, and these these uh, scenarios will have a path. So just point me with your number. Okay, so my name is Sylvester Serigetti. I am 32 years old. I was born in Xinjiang, a farming region in central Tanzania. My mom died when I was young. At the age of 19. In the night before my final school exam, some burglars broke into my home. My dad fought with them and got killed. This year, I'm 24. It has been three years since then. Life has been hard. I tried different things. I work as a day laborer, and sometimes I sell stuff on the street. And that gives me $80 a month, which I can barely cover my expenses. Um, I heard there are a lot of business opportunities in the city of Dar. So I think I'm going to go check that city out and start from scratch. I do have $25 saved with me. However, I don't have $20 for the bus ride. So what did you think I did to get enough money to travel to Dar? One, borrow from one of my relatives. Two, take a loan from a street lender. Or three, sell my phone. Well, there is fans too, okay. Well, I actually sold my phone. Why? At first, I tried to go to my relatives from my father's side. They are farmers, 
And at that time, they didn't have enough money to lend me. They also have very big families. Um, I also thought about taking a loan from a street lender, but a friend told me that they harass your families if you don't pay them on time. So I decided to protect my family and sell my phone. Even though I really liked my phone, I realized that I could get another phone later on. Um, so I sold my phone for $25, and that gave me enough money to get to DAR. So when I first came to DAR, I used to work as a day laborer at a construction site. I did well, so I got promoted to be supervisor. With that, I made $180 per month. Rent and transportation costs are still high in the city, though, and so it didn't uh, allow me to save a lot of money. I, however, noticed at my construction site that um, people who drove uh, trucks were paid twice that of my income. So I asked around, and a small truck cost around $3,500. And I needed to find ways to get that money. So what did you think I did to gather the $3,500? Work as a security guard during nights, quit my job and get a higher payment job, start a side business at a construction site selling food, or apply to Finca, which is a typical financial institution that provides small uh, loans to microentrepreneurs. I see one, three, four, two, oh, it's everywhere. Three, three, I guess. Yeah, three and four. Okay. So, sorry. <laughs> so I ended up working as a security guard. One. Why? For me, someone without a college de degree, it's hard to get a higher salary job. At the construction site, there are plenty of small food vendors. So I realized that I couldn't compete with them. And I did go to Finca and try to apply for a loan. However, they demand collateral, and they only lend to existing businesses. So working as full-time as a security guard at night meant that I could save money in rent and would earn $100 per month more. So that allowed me to save $200 per month. I saved for two years, and that made me have enough money to buy a truck. I bought the truck, uh, and I parked my truck near hardware stores to easily pick up people who need transportation after they purchase. Sometimes I go back to supervise the site as a side hustle. So that gives me around $450 per month. So now I'm married and have an eight-month-year-old baby. Three months ago, my car broke down, and I needed $30 for a spare part. I didn't have money at that time, and that's when I saw Tala on Facebook. I applied and got a loan immediately. Three weeks ago, I borrowed $40, from Tala for my uncle's funeral. Now I'm at the end of the month. My clients paid me $50, but that does not give me enough money to cover my personal expenses, utilities, and my Tala debt. So what do you think I did? What did you, what did you think I decided to pay first among all the bills? Pay off my Tala loan, which is due in two days. Pay my bills first, otherwise my water and electricity will be disconnected. Or renew my car insurance, otherwise I cannot drive my truck. Three, okay? Well, I decided to pay off my Tala loan instead. Why? Once I pay off a Tala loan, I get a bigger loan immediately. With that, hopefully it can cover water and insurance. Then I can wait a little bit, like two days for electricity until I get money for my truck business. Now my next big plan is to buy another truck and rent it out. I want to keep a, the good relationship with Tala because it will enable me to move towards my end goal. For me, the biggest thing is not to break the trust, which is the key to get infinite loans in the future. To build trust with the loan is to reach my goals in life. And that is a key similarity we see across all of our markets, because nobody has trusted in these people before, and because Tala wants to be their long-term financial partner, they don't want to break that trust once they realize we're legit. And Tala, because of that, also wants to keep that trust with our client. It's really important for us to be um, a leader in responsible lending. So regardless of which country or regulatory environment we are in, we feel obligated to lend responsibly. We hold ourselves accountable to the highest standards that any regulator would. And we take a leadership role in setting industry standards for fair and best practices. I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but one of the examples we do, for example, is guard against over-indebtedness, uh, meaning we, through our phone, we can, we can look at whether this cl our clients have any outstanding debt and measure like future capacity, and that is what um, allows us to choose like their subsequent loan size, for example. 
Um, so our goal is not to be like the most ethical lender. Our goal is to put everyone on the, on the equal playing field, right? And our commitment to our mission and consumers also drives us to challenge our limits. From building our team, to building the product, to servicing our customers. We never settle for the easiest or simplest path. We question assumptions, experiment, iterate, and push ourselves to do better. Ultimately, we want our company culture to reflect the kind of world we want to be in. One where everyone is seen, understood, and has an equal potential to fulfill, an equal opportunity to fulfill their potential. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was fantastic. Uh, so building on new technology requires a workforce that is prepared. So we've invited the Associate Dean and Professor of Finance at the California State University at Dominguez Hills to talk to us about the jobs of the future and how he is preparing his students. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Taib Shabir. Good morning. Well, I want to thank uh, LAEDC and the sponsors, uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper and this great school in Carson. <laughs> well, you know, I'm very unbiased here. So very excited to be here. I want to start off by actually asking you a question. Now, how many people in the audience like to play Scrabble? Well, I see several hands, more than I expected. My daughter warned me about it. Dad, nobody plays Scrabble anymore. You scratch this question. But, um, you know, so, uh, uh, so you know, everybody who likes Scrabble, that it's very important to have any word so-called Scrabble certified, my own phrase. That is, it must be part of the dictionary. Very important. Well, great news. In fact, this month, uh, 20 days ago, to be exact, the word fintech, the amalgam word that we are all discussing today, was officially included in the Merriam-Webster dictionary. <laughs> so this should convince everybody and anybody that fintech has arrived. So uh, I thought I'll share that exciting news with you. Uh, moving on, I want to also thank um, all the preceding speakers, not only for very exciting, insightful remarks, but doing me a favor by providing a perfect segue into the three items that I would like to focus on today. Which career paths are needed? What are the market projections for future job growth in FinTech-related occupations? How academic community is preparing the future work of workforce of FinTech? I think in the introduction, I, I felt a little bit pressure, a small amount of pressure. How are you personally preparing them? Well, I, tr I tried to come in 8 o'clock in the morning and leave late. I'm doing my work. But uh, yeah, as a community, of course, we are very mindful, and these are very exciting times. So which career paths are needed? Well, um, some kind of common sense observations can intuitively help us here. You know, the popularity of ATMs imply that fewer tellers are going to be needed. Services like Venmo and Zelle mean more financial engineering software People are needed, you know? And if your preschooler comes home and she says, mom or dad, <laughs> I love blockchain. <laughs> now that means it'll be futile for either of the parents to try to change her mind and try to convince her to be a doctor or an investment banker. You know, she's headed right towards being an entrepreneur, startup entrepreneur. And by that time, blockchain will be ready for prime time 
And there you go, a perfect union. So uh, you get an idea of what kind of career, but you know, unless you have a very high sounding list, people may not think you're that credible. So I prepared one. All right, so these are the kind of things that you would imagine by just even thinking about blockchain or fintech, the two words that it is an amalgam of, you can see you need people in finance proper, technology proper, but most importantly in the union, the intersection. And that itself is not that obvious. It's a new field. There are, there's a dearth of people who really can do fintech. Many people can do fin and they can do tech but few can do FinTech. What are the market, uh, so, so by the way, these are the career paths that are needed, and the second item I wanted to discuss was what are the market projections for future job growth in FinTech-related occupations? So, uh, where is that little dot? Okay, well, that's fine. Um, I've color coded it enough. So, you know, these are Bureau of Labor Statistics projections from 2016 to 2026, 10 year projections. First of all, kindly note that the total all occupation growth rate is 7.4% over this time period. Then let's look at the red font in the column titled growth rate. Most of those are what you would traditionally think of fintech jobs, and those actually overlap with the list I provided with you earlier. Now, uh, also note that some of the lowest gro growth rate jobs, lowest growth rate jobs, are also kind of related with finance and tellers. Fewer are needed. needed. There's, there's a deceleration of demand for that. And one other very quick point I want to make here is that IT jobs are only about 10% of the US jobs. And also, uh, it is not true that the IT jobs are the fastest growing category, just to kind of put everything in perspective. If, if I had more time, you know, professors, before I was associate dean, I was a professor. At heart, I'd always be a professor. You know, this is, a permanent condition that you get rid of. I would have asked you. Sorry, can you turn your microphone off? Oh, you can't hear me? Okay. Yeah, we actually need I'm sorry. Right. Thank you. All right. So don't take the time off of my. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, please, right? Did I say please? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, uh, fortunately I remember the comment I was going to make. So what is the fastest growing category in terms of occupation? You guessed it, healthcare workers, personal aides. You know, that tops 30%, so it's closer to 48. So you know, this is not the only place to make money, or this is not the only place where business is booming, but this, may be the place where business is booming as a, for a worker, and these are high paying jobs. Guess what a personal aid or a healthcare worker makes? 26 to $32,000. So that is what's unique about FinTech. Good jobs and fast growing opportunities. Yeah, so you know, sometimes people get turned off by big tables, so they like their more direct numbers. So I have some here. I'm not going to go into all of them. One of the things I do want to point out that you know Justin had earlier given us, and all the uh, I was very very excited by the way hearing all those uh, insightful comments. So Justin had talked about banking, and you know I have my own views. One of the things we all realize is that some parts of banking are in a nosedive. So you can see that how drastically. Uh, generalized jobs in banking are declining up to almost 38% or so since the financial crisis. But the good news is 25-fold increase from 2008, only 10 years in FinTech. So that means 
market is buying the story. You know, uh, money can be trusted. <laughs> it's not foolish most of the time. <laughs> All right. So um, how academic community is preparing future workforce of FinTech? I happen to find, of course, um, a public university which is doing a great job <laughs> at it. <laughs> and I, I don't know why. why is that funny? <laughs> well, of course, you get the idea. You know, I looked at, when I got this assignment, I must acknowledge I didn't quite realize this. And you know, I said, I said yes, and then decided, wondered how to prepare for it. I've done it a couple times in my life, you know? So I said, yes, of course I'll speak about this. But then when I looked at it, it turns out that we actually are doing quite well. That we have um, programs in finance which talk about financial markets, financial services, accounting, new programs starting, in information systems, so on. So you can kind of get an idea. I have put a yellow highlight on something here in particular, and that's the proposed certificate in FinTech. All right. I, I'll have occasion to talk a little bit more about that. So that occasion is right here, right now, because I have time. So when I just showed you that earlier slide, I cheated a little bit, but only a little bit. So I might have given the impression that, hey, you know, we should get an A plus grade because we're covering the whole spectrum of need. Uh, yes and, and no. So what I missed out here is the fact that where is the blockchain? You didn't see the word blockchain. By the way, blockchain also made Merriam-Webster dictionary, <laughs> just, in, just in case you're wondering. But something very interesting. Uh, blockchain actually beat FinTech by six months. Just more trivia. So what did I leave out here? I left out this very important distinction, and this is, again, terms that I came up with. Uh, so, so pardon me if they don't look too scientific or too formal. I want to make a distinction between traditional fintechs and prospective fintechs. And the difference is one has blockchain and the other doesn't. So when I put in blockchain, I want us to think about prospective fintech and what we are doing there. And um, we were quite prepared. The earlier slide was very orderly. You know, we are not the only school who's doing it. You know, the main point about uh, established needs for FinTech are being met in a very orderly fashion. So there is a projected growth rate, and engineering schools and business schools are doing quite well. They look very organized and under, everything is under control. Where it isn't that pretty looking or under control is when you throw in blockchain. And that's something, again, I had a, a background intuitive idea that it's not that pretty. But when I started looking at it, it's just a scramble. Schools are scrambling. So I'm going to give you some examples. And, um, and not look at the clock for another three or four minutes. I'm just warning you that I'm just not going to look at that. <laughs> so this is kind, kind of important. Um, so I, I started looking at what are the schools which are offering blockchain. There's several on the West Coast and some on the East Coast. An East Coast school, um, I happened to, to look at Warden because they are, I'm, a, I'm an alum, but I also, they, they also have an undergraduate and an MBA course, and they have a FinTech society. And a visiting professor is teaching them. The, the school paper protested, and the students are clamoring for more such courses. Stu students clamoring for courses. How many times does that happen? You know? So there is this element, we want more than MIT, CMU, Carnegie Mellon on the East Coast, NYU, Georgetown, Fordham. These are some of the schools at the forefront, but they're all scrambling. They have one or two offerings. And then everybody's saying, hey, FOMO, 
fear of missing out. Let's do something about it. Now, on the, on the West Coast, I don't want, a, a, you know, I don't want to fall into uh, the Trojan and Bruin sort of conflict, but USC seems to be the leader in fintech. So they, they are hosting, they just hosted the second fintech summit. They have an MBA in fintech. Their engineering school has several blockchain courses. Um, UCI seems to be the, the other school who's doing very, very well. Their school of social sciences has nine blockchain. I don't know why social science got after it, but they did. But UCI also has other courses, but they're all still kind of scrambling. Um, UCLA does have their continuing education is offering a blockchain course. Either I was not very diligent at looking at their offerings, but I did look at Anderson. There was nothing in management. So the mes message, I, I mean, CSUs, of course, beside Dominguez Hills, other sister CSUs are doing very well in their offering courses, and I can go on and on about that thing. But I want to conclude this here. FinTech, traditional FinTech, we are okay. Blockchain, uh, we are scrambling. But don't hold that against academe. Academe is very, very important, and it works in a very uh, uh, definitive way. Academia does research, which is a leading factor. You know, before business gets the grasp of it or, or hear about it, somebody has toiled for years and years and years in academe to bring those ideas to some sort of fruition. And that is a part of academe that, that's often not get given enough credit or ignored. And then business, businesses play a fantastic role, but they're also impatient. They want to make the money now. And they also, in a friendly way, would often kind of, in a hush-hush tone, say, where's the talent? You guys are not producing it fast enough, quickly enough, and the right kind enough. There, academe tends to be a little bit more deliberative. And part of it is because that's the nature of curriculum development. You know, there are, there are things that are bubbling. And today we heard, this is one of the most balanced discussion about black, blockchain I've heard. People pointing out the challenges and the opportunities. And there are fixed costs of developing curriculum, hiring not part-time, or visiting faculty, but the building develop, uh, departments. We cannot do that at a whim. We don't want to do it for, for a technology which has not proven itself. So you know, um, there I still give us a high grade. You can grade us differently. And also, the last point, I, I do have to look at Tyler because he's getting you know, a little bit more serious about it. So this is my last, <laughs> this is my last comment. Academe is a vital partner in this process. We are vital and we are willing. And if you have ideas where, where academia, uh, including public schools like ours, ours and sister CSUs, which are, are we are very proud of the access we provide. So, so, you know, if you have ideas how we can do our job better, maybe improve from the C plus that you've given in us in your mind to a better grade. And, and also, uh, especially important to me and I know to my dean and my president that we would love to have partnerships, uh, especially for our students and the kind of students we serve, they should get their due share in this evolving uh, revolution. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shavir. You can tell your daughter that Scrabble is still alive and well. well but stay up here. We're going to do Q&A now oh, with everybody. So please stay right. up. And Justin, I'll invite you back up. And My story is very it. long. They, they, they tell me a lot of other different things. You don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to please invite all seat. of the yep. speakers up. We're going to do a quick, uh, a quick session up here. <clears throat> All right.
That was fun, good energy in the room. Um, so we have a half an hour for Q&A, and I don't know how many copious questions are kind of lurking about for all the speakers, um, but I'm gonna get things started, and then, but we'd really like to spend a lot of time getting some questions from the group. Um, I'm, uh, I, can, I think I got two questions for on the, in the blockchain space, space and, um, and, but I kind of want to focus on maybe a, a little bit about the, the, the concept of ac academia and the playing in, in terms of talent pools and you know, uh, pr public and private partnerships. So um, one of the questions that I had um, for you, Tayyib, was um, if, if, if we're in a place where uh, there's, a, there's always an amazing statistic around that a certain percentage of the jobs just that people are going to have in five years haven't even been invented yet, right? There's, yep. And, you know, when we look back five years, ten years, you know, it's tough for any of us to kind of maybe put our place like where we're going to be right, right now. What, how, how is, it, so there's, there's a certain amount of things that you can measure and prepare for, yes. but then what about... What, what do you, and this is something that is, um, is close to us at PwC, our average age is about 27. And so we you know, do a lot of recruiting out of schools, including the UC system, and then have to train people. But what, what are the things that ac academia is doing to prepare people for the unknown, right? And give them the skills that they need in order to be able to learn the next thing. Yes, well, well thank you so much. Um, uh, you know, in, uh, the, the big chart I showed you about the BLS, um, I, there, there were many disclaimers and caveats, which are very critical, and you are actually indirectly speaking to one of those caveats. So BLS um, projections are often underestimates when it comes to disruptive industries, because the techniques they use, they basically rely on past data, and they just kind of sort of a regression analysis just passed is going to continue. So they miss out, you know, if tomorrow um, cryptocurrency gets uh, thumbed up by uh, all the regulators of the world and SEC and blockchain truly moves beyond uh, the lettuce that Walmart is using it to track. And it, and, and it is very, very promising technology. So for instance, blockchain, related developments are not being captured by BLS. So there you need to do this kind of a narrative and say, how are we preparing for the big present surprises of tomorrow? And I do want to, uh, having made the general comment, I, I also want to point out um, very quickly two, two, two developments that we should keep in mind those who are not in academia. And one of them is that um, entrepreneurship has become, uh, it has gone from zero to 60 in, in a hurry. And, you know, entrepreneurship is actually the fodder for many of the startups and it has changed the mindset. So I think the growth in entrepreneurship is our security or is an insurance that new things when they pop up, we will have entrepreneurial minded students prepared to, to deal with that. The second thing I want to point out is that while blockchain and fintech and our lives around us are evolving and changing because of technology's interplay, academia is also involved, uh, evolving and actually the whole process of learning, how learning takes place is evolving, how learning takes place over our life cycle. No more, there is a definitive entry and exit. 22, typically, I'm out of school, never to look back, or some of us may stay another few years, get a PhD. There is a notion of lifelong learning, so there are multiple entry and exit points. And also, a lot of the learning happens in businesses now, on the job training. Learning by doing is a very, very big element, much bigger than it has ever been. So that's why when I just mentioned prospective partnership, it was not meant to be just a cliche. Actually, it was not meant to be cliche at all. So I really see that just, just uh, technology people, the way they are excited about blockchain, in academia uh, we are and we ought to be very, very excited about these partnerships. Because you know the whole process of learning over 
a worker's lifetime has, is organically developing and evolving. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take on, you know, one of the things that you look at Coursera, edX, a um, lot of the learning happens through YouTube videos, mm -hmm. you know? Um, Berkeley, while they were scrambling, they put a blockchain online course, which was first offered in 90, uh, sorry, 2016, and 70 people enrolled. This semester, uh, they're offering it again, and guess how many students have enrolled? I'm sorry? 700. 700? Thank you for saying that, <laughs> because it makes my punchline sound so much better. <laughs> 7,400. Wow. So, you know, uh, this is an online course. This is a certificate course. This is not a traditional offering. So, you know, I see academe evolving, changing as we as workers are changing and businesses are changing. And one of the elements I think within academia and otherwise we'll also like to have a discussion about private schools and public schools. Our mission statements are very different. How nimble we can be, the kind of resources we have, those processes are very different. So, you know, I think for state schools who are kind of limited to what the legislator feels we ought to have, uh, they actually are in much greater need for those partnerships for businesses so we can provide uh, we can have a better resource inflow, so we can be almost as nimble as the private schools who enjoy relatively large endowments. So, you know, there are a lot of discussions, and I will keep it brief <laughs> and stop here. <laughs> So, Brian, Elise, you know, within the blockchain space, I think we've seen this at PwC in terms of ramping up our blockchain practice. And, Brian, I thought you summarized it really well that a lot of these things are very early stage, you know, the business applications. But what are you seeing from a talent perspective? And, and Elise, I think you, you kind of looked, talked about that well. Is you're not only when you're evaluating a company, you're looking at the in-house developers, but then all the people that are contributing to the code outside. So there's a large ecosystem of people but I'm sure you're, you also have your ear to the ground in terms of, you know, what are the what what kind of talent gaps there are, especially in a blockchain space where you're looking for people with understand business application and technology. So just wondering if you can kind of uh, continue on the same theme and what you're seeing. Yeah, oh, you want to go, go ahead. Okay, uh, so that's a really great question. So on the talent side of things, we there's definitely a need for blockchain developers. If you look, if you talk to any company right now building in the crypto space they will literally give you $10,000 if you can refer them a legitimate blockchain engineer, like just straight up. And I'm talking from experience, like we get pitched many, many times a day and these companies will say, hey, if you guys know of any good engineers, we'd be willing to pay you a really nice referral fee for a good uh, blockchain developer. Uh, that's because, you know, being able to develop on, on infant tech, like you mentioned, you re it requires like knowledge of finance programming, business, and even regulation. So it's a kind of like an interesting, and also legal. So it's a very interesting combination of skills that is necessary to be like a really good, solid developer in the space to help build these like early stage companies. Um, also in terms of talent, I wanna say like there's a lot of high quality talent coming into the space. Uh, you see people from Wharton, Harvard, all like all the top names. Also people coming from Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, all these large companies are leaving these push jobs or they're leaving investment banks to join companies building on blockchain technology or you know leveraging cryptocurrency so as far as talent is is concerned i see a huge influx of high quality talent and also a need for this new type of like blockchain enabled talent Okay, so I think when Brian's talking, uh, speaking about blockchain engineers and the need for talent, you're speaking specifically about companies that are building blockchains themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important for uh, ever, uh, the audience to know, I think, that there's companies also that are building in the space and have achieved great scale and or newer companies that don't require a blockchain engineer on the team in order to, to build a robust business. And so the types of talent that are relevant in those cases are, are just traditional functional roles. So 
marketing or, or, or if we're talking about technical talent, one gap that has existed in the space is on the design and UX side. Um, and so it's easy to transition, frankly, from a traditional role at another startup outside of the blockchain space and even fintech space into the ecosystem because you just don't need to be a blockchain engineer to participate. And most companies, all of the companies, I, the majority of companies that I've invested in that have made investments in blockchain <laughs> engineers have done so as a way to contribute in goodwill. Um, back to open source development versus building blockchains themselves. So the, in my blockchain portfolio, it's just Chia Network that's building their own, own blockchain. And of course, they need blockchain developers for that. But otherwise, it's a traditional startup based on um, a new infrastructure. Got it. And uh, one more question, Andrea, for you, and then we'll open it up to the group. So um, on the theme of user experience, you guys have a, an app that you've built for a worldwide audience. And, and so you have um, psychographics that are varied in all of those countries and how people like to you know, swipe and what they like to do and what they need to see in multi-language. What, what was... What, was, what were some of the kind of things that you had to put into in terms of making that accessible for a worldwide audience? So making the, like, what, what does the app need to be is or the, have? Is the app standard across every country? Yeah, so because we, there's different, like, know your customer, uh, regulatory requirements, because there are different ways to transact money. Like, for example, in East Africa, everybody uses M-Pesa, so they don't really need for, to give us a bank account to disburse money. Uh, they just, they, we just disperse to their phone number, basically. So those are the differences that make the process different. However, we try to keep as the, the process of applying, like the questions um, and the flow of the app as homogeneous as possible. But yeah, there are differences because like I, I manage the remittance-based markets like Philippines and Mexico, and it's totally different than the East Africa Got it. markets. And was that something that you considered in terms of the design process to make it as kind of similar as possible? Yeah, we've we've like um, thought about doing just a global APK, but it just it's it's even it's harder because you will then have to turn on and off certain capabilities in each market, um, and that makes it I guess more cumbersome uh, at the same time. Got it. Yeah. Questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, Acknowledge that blockchain is slow. Uh, I don't think that's something we've heard much of. But one of the things that we've heard a lot about is the environmental consequences of blockchain at this stage. I think when I first heard about this new computer-based technology, I didn't imagine that there could be environmental consequences to it. But can you talk about that? Yeah. So I'm um, guessing by that you might be referring to the amounts of energy that is being used to secure uh, blockchain-based networks. Yeah, just mining, I guess. Yeah, mining. So Bitcoin is probably the most notorious one for this uh, because it uses a consensus mechanism called proof of work. And just on a high level, what that means is you have to solve these ridiculously crazy cryptographic math problems and solve them correctly, which takes a lot of computing power. And this is like, you know, imagine running your computer at home 24 hours a day, but multiply that by a computer that's like a thousand more, more times powerful, and then put that in a factory in China and then have like 10 factories doing that all day, every day. So that's a lot of like environmental strain and that's definitely a problem. And there's a, there's a lot of people working on this and I'll give you two examples. The first one is people are looking at alternative consensus mechanisms. So instead of a proof of work consensus mechanism where you solve these problems and waste energy, there's a new type of consensus mechanism called proof of stake. In which case you're staking um, instead of like solving math problems to get the opportunity to mine the next block. You are staking down coins, so if Bitcoin in theory moved to proof of stake, you can maybe uh, stake three or four Bitcoin, and the more Bitcoin you stake, the higher probability you have to mine the next block, which is what incentivizes people to do proof of work, proof of stake. And that way you're not using computing resources, but you're just like betting money in a, in a sense. Uh, another way that I think is really interesting is 
uh, there's a new consensus mechanism called proof of useful work. So instead of just solving crazy cryptographic problems, you might be solving some academic professor's crazy math problem that he needs solved, or you're helping Pixar render their next uh, movie, right? You're kind of like using these computing powers in a useful way, instead of just a way that's uh, kind of just wasting energy for the for the network. Or there's people doing like, oh, solar panels, you know, there's renewable energy uh, initiatives to help with proof of work. But there's a few people, like it's definitely a recognized issue, and there's a lot of people working on ways to uh, secure networks without just doing proof of work. But I'll caveat this whole thing with saying proof of work is the only proven way and longest standing uh, mechanism to secure networks that hasn't been hacked yet. So that's why people stay with it. Yeah, hi, I'm Mike Grimshaw from Cal State Mingus in the entrepreneurship area. And I'm just wondering, we have about 70% of women at our school. And I'm wondering about the future for women in FinTech, in the areas that you guys have been talking about. How can I encourage my students to be more progressive in what areas that they need to focus on and be successful? I appreciate some comments on that. Sure, and I, I hadn't realized the demographic makeup, so I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I mean, it's, so it's it, so I've been in the space in the blockchain space for a long time, like was noted at the beginning, um, and and if you have students that are interested in this space, what I've found to be uh, one of the most exciting things is that, frankly, the talent that really what makes you unique in the blockchain space is if you understand the concepts of decentralization and how that how that differentiates the type of value proposition or company or opportunity that can be built. And because a blockchain is based on a consensus al algorithm, it's based on agreement between, between different stakeholders. It's actually a collaborative process. And to me, it seems like an inherently feminine process. And of course, there's a broad spectrum of women, right? Like there's, and the way that folks work. And so some women, I, but I think what's true of all women is that we're socialized to be more collaborative. And that was actually the innovation that Satoshi offered when he invented Bitcoin. So most of the pieces that of, of the technology were things that had already been introduced. For instance, the founder of Blockstream, one of my first portfolio companies in the space, Adam Back, invented Hashcash, um, long, which is the uh, used for the consensus mechanism in Bitcoin. And that was invented long before Bitcoin was introduced. But what was new was how to align incentives in a way that allowed people to collaborate. And so to understand that core concept of what makes Bitcoin unique and different, it, you have to understand collaboration and be comfortable with it. And so it's a field, I think, where there's incredible opportunity for women to quickly differentiate themselves, including um, younger and newer talent. And I, I think the best opportunities right now in the blockchain and Bitcoin space are in marketing, business, operations, and um, like web design and UX, just because there's been a dearth of talent there. And coming up with new ideas to use blockchain. You know, blockchain is like a car, or like, a, like internet. You know, it, it's not going to, I mean, it can't sprout ideas organically, but, you know, it's just a process. And I'll add two things to that question. Um, you, your, your students can approach a lot of non nonprofit organizations and networks of women uh, that are actually based here in LA. So I'm the chairman of the board of Latinas in Tech. We just started a chapter in LA, and it was founded in Silicon Valley. Um, Latinas in Tech. There's another one called Girls in Tech, or Women yep. in Tech. Like we we like co-sponsor a lot of events for women to find mentorship. Um, so that's one. Another one, when I was, when I, I've been in two fintech startups in LA, and one of the things that brought me into Tala is because 50% of the leadership is women. Our founder, Shivani Soraya, is an Indian woman. Um, and I love that. And that was one of the things that brought me into Tala. Because from day one, as a Latina in tech, I could leverage my cultural connections and my expertise and launch Mexico like without having a country manager in Mexico to help me with connections or operations, they just trusted me to do it. That's important because we're 65% Latina in our school. Well, yeah, I'll... Yeah. I'm sorry. The... So, um, this question for you, Justin, as well as um, many other panelists, but um, in the beginning of your presentation, you talked about um, the bank school, um, you know, in tech, 
how um, some of the banks have been a little slower to adopt these technologies. And I've been kind of at the forefront. You know, it's been these smaller fintech companies that are technology companies. Um, do some work for one of the big banks. <laughs> I, you know, I've seen it firsthand how a lot of the regulations that banks deal with is part of what stymies them to know whether it's the SEC, uh, FDIC. You know, um, the banks view it as, you know, first and foremost, they have to protect their consumers' deposits mm -hmm. and have that responsibility. Um, the smaller fintech companies haven't yet had to deal with a whole lot of regulation. You know, we talked a little bit about the SEC, um, you know, starting to regulate on tokens, but not on cryptocurrency. Um, and now we're starting to see with Facebook, for instance, you know, with all of the data issues there surrounding the previous election. They're starting to face some regulation um, challenges. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on, you know, when regulations will start to, to impact some of these companies. Um, yeah. And well, it's interesting. One of the big topics right now is the California Privacy Act, which just got put out, which everybody's trying to wrap their head around what that exactly means. Um, and essentially, what what I can tell right now is that it's starting to get into information sharing between you know a primary a, a prime bank and any of the fintechs where they're sharing information on the, at the benefit of the customer and how you regulate the information via you know information exchange via APIs, um, and so you know that is going to have one of those impacts where. Um, it could have an impact where, you know, smaller banks are going to be, you know, again, kind of, uh, well, everybody's going to be impacted. It's just a matter of to what degree. And then we'll see in terms of if there's going to be any kind of favorability for smaller banks that don't exactly have the scale to respond to a regulatory measure like that in a, in a meaningful and a very quick response time. But I think the, the, the bigger, that's one of the things that's coming out that's kind of this evolving story in terms of regulation. But then the other part of it is that, you know, banks have been really protected by those regulations. So what, when you're seeing like the, the, the value chain, the bundling, the unbundling, you know, a lot of the technology companies are coming right up to the line by which they would be a regulated institution and then stopping. And I think the, the banks are still protected in a lot of ways behind that. Um, but you also have a lot of conversations right now about fintech charters, and this is where the line gets a little blurry, you know, of, you know, uh, fintechs um, like Tala, right, if, as they kind of are servicing, um, they're servicing a lot of a lot of people with microloans around the world, eventually they're going to do the same kind of adjacency and pivot, right, and then start offering some other products maybe, and then all of a sudden they're regulated in a, in a new way. Um, I don't know what the end game is. I know that um, you know banks are going to still going to continue to be highly regulated, and a lot of the technology companies, blockchain, crypto, are going to kind of see they're going to come right up to the barrier, and you know we'll see how how things play out there. Um, I know Brian, you put at the top of your list, not SEC regulated at this point as a currency. Um, you know, as uh, to Elise's point, as as in private banks, as as people kind of say, I really kind of want to get into this, but I don't want to go through a, another provider. I want my J.P. Morgan account to contain currency. All of a sudden, you're going to get into this space where um, they're going to legitimize the currency, and then it's going to be regulated, and it's it, it's it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting. I'd love to get other comments. Just if we have time for one more question. Okay, I was going to make a quick point. I think regulation is a huge. Uh, avenue for mass adoption of crypto and blockchain. Uh, Republic specifically, we're SEC registered and federal licensed as a funding portal to make sure everything that we do has been compliant with current securities law. Uh, in fact, on my crypto team, we have four lawyers that have been securities litigators in the past to make sure that everything that we do in terms of fundraising, um, facilitating growth of blockchain-based companies is in compliance with um, U.S. state or U.S. law and also in sometimes international law because like blockchain is a global phenomenon. So in order for these things to take off, I think they have to be done in compliance with um, the SEC and the regulations. Um, but also there, it's, a, it's a two way street, right? The SEC also has to be aware and educated about this, these technologies to provide proper regulation to uh, make sure that the proper growth is being made or else people are gonna leave and start building in Singapore, or Switzerland and places like that. One more question, Dr. Yeah, thanks. Um, we started, I think, with Justin's question to 
naive about what is higher education doing. So perhaps a comment and a, and a question to end. The three things I think real quick that we are doing in higher education. First, what I see as a trend is we are challenging our own biases and assumptions about what traditional education is about and challenging our, our thinking in terms of how myopic it has been so that instead of being singularly focused, science has usually two contexts. One is the context of discovery, the other is the context of confirmation. We spend a lot of time confirming ideas through our research that helps to move it along in kind of micro steps but less on the discovery side. That is now starting to flip. And I think I see trends where we're starting to be that. So challenging our biases. Secondly, we are moving in spaces that allow us to create a climate where innovation and creativity are now more valued and taught for students to think more creatively. And really building spaces, I think, for us to be able to do that. So if you think about the, 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 the new uh, dean, Dean LePolk will f oversee a new science building that is about science and innovation. Uh, Dean Wynn and uh, uh, Associate uh, Dean Taib will go into a new space that will have innovation and technology, even in the title, that invites students to be in the spaces. So as we challenge our own biases, create the spaces for people to do that, right? And then we get more interdisciplinary even our own thinking. Those are three quick things, I think, that we are doing in higher education to be able to do that. My question to the panel and to you is, in my own writing and research, I've stylized a piece of wisdom that says that life at its best is a creative synthesis of opposites and fruitful harmony. Fancy way of saying sometimes your greatest strength can also be your greatest weakness. We get sustainable stuff, right? Tankless water heaters. But you gotta run it five more minutes than you would a regular faucet, right? To get the hot water to circulate. Our best strength becomes sometimes our greatest weakness depending on the context. You've talked a lot today in FinTech about what are some of the great strengths and opportunities. A little less balance, I think, on but what are the cautions we need to pay attention to so that as we move in this particular direction, here's some things you just want to be mindful of. I wonder if you could spend a minute talking about how do we synthesize those opposites, both with the creative genius that each of you represent, but also with the cautions we as an audience need to pay attention to. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Hi. I think you know, I agree with I hundred percent agree with everything that you have said. <laughs> Being the president of Dominguez. But um, you know, as putting on my anonymous hat for a second, you know, f fintech is not a panacea and of course the as you rightly pointed out the great benefits, but the elephant in the room that we didn't have time to talk about is the, the security of the information. I speak from personal experience. Um, I, my identity got stolen, and it was an IRS refund that I didn't expect. It was huge. I called them. They said, oh, yeah, you know, you do this, you do this. You send your case to us. We'll put you in a tight, watertight hold, and we'll watch you every uh, 10 days after they took over my case. They sent me a letter that while we were investigating it, IRS, your identity was stolen again. So, you know, this is just uh, a kind of uh, uh, informal story to point out that, uh, you know, we have kind of resigned ourselves to privacy. What privacy? So we cannot ignore those things with abandon. You know, we, we just have to be very, very careful. Hopefully there will be a cultural, sociological, legal, and technological solution that minimizes that. But, but to me, that is one of the biggest challenges. Thank you. Sandra? Yeah, one of, well, that, uh, yeah, so the, the balance is that that data has become a currency for our customers, right? Because that is how they're able to access loans. Um, everything in our database is encrypted. For example, I cannot see, like, the, the pin that a customer uses. Uh, that they used to send into the phone. So everything is encrypted. We all have VPNs to go uh, to, to connect to the database. Um, that is something that we need to be more cautious once we start building that partnerships with the banks or with a loan servicing software like Mambo, right? That is when, like, as a startup, as a fintech startup, we can't do everything, right? Now we do everything, but it's going to become to a point where we won't be able to do everything. 
And to scale, you need to share. Like, you need to share your system. And so that, that I would agree with you, that it is a point of caution. I think uh, on just specifically on blockchain, uh, something we should be cautious about is one of the core tenets of crypto and blockchain is this idea of decentralization, where you're removing the central authority from everything and you're decentralizing everything so that you can cut out the middleman and everybody can own a little bit of everything, pretty communistic. But you know, it, what if in the future we do reach that state of decentralization and then you're like, you have a problem, but then who do you go to? There's no central authority to go to to report your problem. You forgot your password. There's no one that holds your password except for yourself because you're an individual node in crypto. So I think, you know, as we build these decentralized systems, something to think about is like, will we miss the idea of having a centralized authority in the future that we hate so much, right? Like, do we, like, we hate Facebook, right? Well, not everybody, but like, there's a concept of Facebook being like this evil, you know, being that stores all your data and has all your information. But it's kind of nice if you want to say like, I want to yeah. see this picture that I took five years ago, like, curious, like, you can just get it. So, and they like manage that for you. So there is aspects of centralization that are good. And it's important to keep that in mind as these people that are like these extremists that are saying like decentralize all the things. So there's a, you gotta be careful about that. Yeah, it's like being asked prove that you're not dead. Yeah, of course, I'm here <laughs> and I, Elise. Okay, so I think then, um, I guess I'll offer the, the counter point that decentralization and core principles of Bitcoin that have or haven't been applied to other cryptocurrencies, um, the technology is very powerful. And if the principles change, they can become permanent. So the reason why decentralization is important is so you can opt in and opt out of using Bitcoin so that you're not forced to do one or the other. And also so that Bitcoin are fungible, meaning like if you have a Bitcoin, you can always use that Bitcoin. It can't get like black marketed where it's tagged on, it's on a, you know, some sort of list that Coinbase won't accept or another won't accept. And because there's a cap on number of Bitcoin, it's, at, it's imperative that the tokens remain fungible and the system needs to be broadly decentralized for that to be true. More generally, I'll say that I think the risk in our field of tech broadly is not considering the cultural or social consequences of our work, especially when the technology is powerful or when infrastructures like the internet, right, which Bitcoin gets compared to a lot, are being built. There'll be consequences, we'll make mistakes, but the mistakes will have, you know, will go forward. And so to be thoughtful in our work on, on social and cultural repercussions is critical at the building stage. And I think I'll close with, you know, when we, when we kind of, um, frame out what you know digital and what it means to banking and fintech um, trust is a huge piece of uh, of that and some of that is cyber and some of that is information sharing and I, I kind of I think a lot of the things that we are we that we value in terms of um, uh, just you know I, I noticed the other day when I was opening up a bank app or some other app that my now my ways is actually telling me when to leave for things I don't know if mm -hmm. everybody's seen that so cross app cross app communication mm -hmm. you know between your apps is is you know a very seamless kind of delighted like oh you know traffic's really bad Justin get your butt going or you're not going to make it across the bay bridge that was really nice, but oh wait, you know this app is talking to this app and they know where I'm supposed to be and it's evaluating my calendar. I don't know how I, I'm, am I going to be okay with that? And so all of this stuff where we're, you know, I'm coaching banks on how to appeal to that upper right hand corner. It's kind of the same thing. It's number one, it's been done for years, and number two, it's this is this is kind of the things we we are. We're, we're giving up, right? Where we're saying we're gonna expose when our free Gmail accounts are free because they're monetizing their data. Banks are eventually have, have amazing access to data, never figured out how to monetize it. That eventually will change. And then, you know, it's kind of have to, when are we gonna get, if we're gonna have control over that? I think that's another great topic for the future of whether people can say, I'd like all my, no charges for banking if you wanna use my, if you wanna use my information, or feel free to charge me, but my spending information stays internal. Um, there's these big trust issues um, that are, are happening, but we've really come to rely on them for the right product at the right time and for all of the things that we come to rely on on a daily basis. Thank you. So much to all of you, the experts or creative geniuses as you call them.
Uh, thank you all of you, the diehards who stayed till the very end. And thank you. Sorry we were over by 20 minutes. Uh, our next future forum will continue on January 30th on the economics of the aging population. Uh, so please visit our website. Thank you again. Do you have